Right. It's my it's my third book and my second book on the Civil War. Excellent. And, the, and and tell us just a little bit about the previous one, which also involved Gettysburg. It did. And, and I, the first book I ever wrote was actually not about the Civil War. It was about Flight 93, the September mm-hmm. 11th flight that uh, crashed uh, not far, you know, about 100 miles from where I live in Pittsburgh. Um, and I really got into that. But I, re- I always wanted to write about the Civil War. So the one before this, it was called Gettysburg Rebels. Uh, for a while, I, was, I wasn't sure that there were so many books written about civ- the Civil War in Gettysburg. I wasn't sure there were any more fresh topics. Mm-hmm. But I, I, it's about five guys who grew up in Gettysburg and ended up fighting for the Confederate Army in the Battle of Gettysburg. So the, the, the odd situation where they were foreign invaders in their hometown. And the curious thing is, even though the Confederate Army got lost twice, Robert E. Lee apparently was never told, that never made it up the ranks, that, hey, there are five guys from Gettysburg in our army. Now, whether that would have any effect on the outcome of the battle, I don't know, but I just found it very interesting. But it, it, it started a theme that continues here. One of, the, one of the key figures was Wesley Culp, who's relatively well-known to people who follow Gettysburg and Culp's Hill. It's a famous name. And most of the legend of, Gettys, of Wesley Culp that was out there is wrong. So part of it was, was kind of digging into that. And that led into this book where the same, you know, we, 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 there's so many legends and stories that start. And once they start, they, it's, it's a snowball going downhill. They get momentum and we all tend to believe them. And this arm, you know, this project was, was a little bit of a shock to me at the beginning, you know, what I found. Cause well, I, let, let's, let's come to that. And in and, and just a second, that'll be the word we start. Let me welcome people. Um, I'm Lee Wright, the founder of history camp. And I want to start out with a thanks to, everyone who has donated as part of our annual campaign. Uh, Last year, we put on 50 talks throughout the year, uh, every Thursday night, and we were thrilled to do that. We greatly appreciate individuals who have uh, shown their appreciation and supported the nonprofit organization that puts these on. Uh, The nonprofit organization is called The Pursuit of History. And if you go to the History Camp site, at historycamp.org on the left hand side you'll see a donate button uh so if you haven't had a chance we would greatly appreciate your uh support as we continue this into 2022. uh with me in virginia is hi i'm carrie lund i'm the director of the pursuit of history the nonprofit that brings these history camp discussions to you each week we are excited to welcome Tom McMillan tonight. Tom is a lifelong student of the Civil War and has served on the Board of Trustees of Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh's Heinz History Center, the Board of Directors for the Friends of Flight 93 National Memorial, and the Marketing Committee of Gettysburg Foundation. His previous books include Flight 93, The Story, The Aftermath, and The Legacy of American Courage on 9-11, and Gettysburg Rebels, Five Native Sons, who came home to fight as Confederate soldiers, which won the Batchelder Coddington Literary Award. He is joining us tonight to discuss his new book, Armistead and Hancock, Behind the Gettysburg Legend of Two Friends at the Turning Point of the Civil War. Thank you for joining us, Tom. Carrie, Lee, great to be here. Thank you. Well, Tom, uh, it, it, so, so you've got a, a, a great perspective then as you started on this book. And I, I think many people who are watching tonight may be familiar with these two principal individuals from reading perhaps the, the book Killer Angels or perhaps seeing the movie Gettysburg. Um, you took a deep dive in your research and I think came to a somewhat different conclusion than perhaps what people took away from those two, uh, those two sources. I really did. And Lee, I guess I should start by saying of all the gifts I got my wife for Christmas, the one she liked the most, was the Teddy Roosevelt Rough Riders t-shirt from the history. Lab. Excellent. <laughs> it's been worn several times. It was worn in Gettysburg over the weekend. So, so thank oh. you so much. But it, it, it is true. And, and I think so many people, and I fall into this category, I the movie Gettysburg had a huge impact on me in my life. It's what got me reinterested in studying the battle as an adult. I was interested as a kid, but then as often happens, life gets in the way. That movie came out, and it, I saw it in a theater in Pittsburgh on a Tuesday night. I drove to Gettysburg three nights later, and I was I was hooked forever. Um, and I I actually saw the movie before I read the novel it was based on. But, you know, and what I remind people all the time is that Killer Angel is such a great book. The, and the subtitle is the word novel, and it won the Pulitzer Prize 
for fiction. And I always remind my friends that in the movies based on that. So, but a movie is so powerful that all those stories in that movie had such an effect on all of us. You tend to believe because you've seen them, they've almost come to life. And, you know, one of the stories that really, the story that most impacted me from that movie was the story of Armistead and Hancock, the almost brothers thing. It, you know, it grabs you right away. And I wanted to learn more about that. And I wanted to read more about it. And I thought there would be a book about it. There wasn't a book about it. Um, so I, st I thought, well, I'll, 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 I'll try to research Lewis Armistead. There has to be a lot written about the Confederate soldier who, general who achieved the deepest uh, penetration into the ankle. And I have this little prop here. In 158 years, this is the only book written about Lewis Armistead. It's 48 pages. Uh, and so you start, okay, well, there's a lot written about Hancock, really a lot. You know, he's a hero of the battle. He lives for 20 years after the war. He runs for president in 1880. But all those books, late 19th century until just a few years ago, most of them barely mention Armistead. Some don't mention him at all. So really, it's it's, it's kind of what, what gives here, what this story is not lining up that everybody talks about. And I, I asked a, some of my Civil War friends, serious students of the battle, always see them up in Gettysburg, what they knew about the story of Armistead and Hancock. And almost to a person, what they knew came from several scenes in the movie Gettysburg, <laughs> where where Armistead is, is, is having a, a, a talk with his commanding officer, James Longstreet, on the eve of the Battle of Gettysburg. And he's talking about uh, Hancock and he's talking about a farewell party they had uh, on California when they split up to fight for different armies. And, and Carrie, these are, these are the quotes. One of the most powerful scenes in the movie, and he quotes himself, he says, uh, when, so help me, if I ever raise my hand against you, may God strike me dead. And, I think that's one of the scenes you take away from that movie. These guys were so close that Armistead, who's a hard-nosed soldier, can't even bring himself to think about fighting Hancock, even they're going off to fight against each other uh, in a war. They, 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 you know, they've been in the army together for 20 years. But there was only one person who was there who ever wrote about it, and that was Han uh, Hancock's wife, Elmira. And what she said, he said, she does quote him as saying, may God strike me dead, but what she said, he said, was... I hope God will strike me dead if I'm ever induced to leave my native soil should worse come to worst. Now, that is far less dramatic than what the movie has, but she was there. So you start to pick through and say, how's this happen? You know, it, it was a novel and it was a movie based on a novel and they're, they're trying to sell their narrative to you and grab you. So basically what you realize that, that a lot of the conversation in that book and that movie were made up. They were there to make a point, um, but they're made, but those of us, and I fell into this, this category, you see it and you believe that's what's said. So part of it was, okay, I, I want to find what really happened. And by the way, for anybody out there who saw the movie, those conversations between, between Armistead and Longstreet, they didn't happen either. That was all made up. So I don't criticize the, the novelist Michael Shaw. He's a fabulous you know, Pulitzer Prize winner. Um, cause he, he admitted this was a novel. It was, it was those of us who took it as fact, uh, who kind of made the mistake. So that started the odyssey of let's find out what really, what the story was, uh, behind these two guys Were they, friends? cause some people, there was a backlash. So we said, you know, this was all made up. They weren't even friends at all. So I wanted to kind of figure out. Yeah, sure. Sure. Exactly well, why, why don't we start with background on Armistead? Okay. And, and that was most fascinating to me because what, so, as I pointed out, so little written about Armistead. People really know very little about his story. And what they know comes from the movie, again, which is not all correct. Amazing family. Uh, been in, the U been, uh, in America since the year 1636. Uh, they'd, they'd been represented in, in, the, in the military since the year 1680, when Lewis's third great-grandfather was running the horse militia in Gloucester County, Virginia. They fought in all the early American wars. And in, in the generation just before him, uh, his father and three of his uncles were U.S. Army officers in the War of 1812. Two of them were named Lewis and Addison. They gave their lives in the war. Our guy's name is Lewis Addison Armistead. He was named for those two. The third brother is George Armistead, who defended Fort McHenry when Francis Scott Key wrote the national anthem. 
like that. But the, the flag exists today because George, in clear violation of army rules, took that flag home as a souvenir, and it remained in his family's private possession for 90 years. That may be a future book for me. And then Lewis's father, Walker Keith Armistead, not very famous now, very prominent in, in the day, third man ever to graduate from West Point. He makes it all the way to Brigadier General. Um, so it's no coincidence, as I by research, that, that Lewis Armistead became a soldier or that his three younger brothers became Confederate soldiers and fought in the Civil War, which I did not know before I did this research. Or that his son, also named Walker Keith, was a Confederate soldier on his staff at the Battle of Gettysburg, an eyewitness to Pickett's charge. So military service is part of the Armistead DNA. Uh, Lewis wants to go to West Point. He gets to, he easily gets in because his dad's, his dad's a brigadier general. Um, probably the most fascinating career of anyone who never graduated. Uh, three years on campus, never got out of the freshman class. Uh, sick a little bit, not a very good student. Gets in a little bit of trouble. But third year on campus, 1836, there's an entry in his records up at West Point. It's fast. The West Point Library is just fascinating. If anybody gets a chance, gets a chance to go up there, the records are remarkable. But January of 36, it said, you know, he's in trouble, uh, disorderly conduct in the mess hall and uh, limited to his room. He got in as much as we could figure out a mess hall brawl with another future Confederate general, Jubal Early, and hit Early over the head with a plate. And he's about to get thrown out of school. And it, his, he and his dad realized they better do something. He write, actually writes a letter of resignation. So you often hear that Armistead was thrown out. He wasn't. He resigned. It was accepted as a courtesy to his dad. Um, he Three years later, he enter, enters the Army and begins a 22-year U.S. Army career. Uh, and uh, he, uh, he meets Hancock then when they're, serving on the, when, when they're serving on the frontier. So Louis Armistead, uh, uh, the Army was part of his life. There was no question he was going to be a soldier, uh, and he did serve in the U.S. Army for 22 years. Well, then let's go to Winfield Scott Hancock. Yeah, he is, uh, you know, I thought, because there's so much written, I thought I knew a lot about Hancock. You really, I'm sure everybody in this call is, is like this. You get humbled when you start to do this research and find out how much you don't know. I thought I knew a lot about Hancock. Turned out I didn't know much at all. Um, he doesn't have the military pedigree of the Armisteads, but and nobody did. But his father has this thing for historic names, that father being Benjamin Franklin Hancock. And he and his wife have twin boys, and they name one Winfield Scott after the famed soldier. They name the other Hillary Baker, which is not very well known to us today, but they're from southeastern Pennsylvania. Hillary Baker had been mayor of Philadelphia. He'd fought in the Revolutionary War, so he was well known at the time. Six years later, they have another son. They name him simply John, John Hancock. And uh, John Hancock is with his brother Winfield at Gettysburg. So both Armistead and Hancock have immediate family members with them there. Uh, Armistead, or Hancock, I flip their names all the time. Sorry about that. Hancock gets an appointment to West Point when he's 16. Uh, his dad is not sure it's such a good idea. Uh, not only is he young, and six, 16 is the youngest age you could get in, but he's small. We have this image of big strapping Winfield Scott Hancock, huge guy. When he entered West Point, he was five feet, five inches tall. Uh, one of the fellow soldiers said they actually referred to Hancock in those early years as their pet. The great Winfield Scott Hancock was a pet at West Point. So just think of that. Um, and he, he, had, he gets a growth spurt. He's six feet tall by the time he leaves. But he's small for all. He gets picked on. And at one point, it's so bad that one of the large one of his larger classmates has to step in and, and fight one of the bullies on his behalf. And that classmate is Alexander Hayes, who ends up commanding a division under Hancock in Pickett's Charge. The relationships are really strange. Hancock, you know, some of those stories are apocryphal, but Hancock writes about this. He, he never forgot it. He wrote later that, you know, when I was a young man, I had a difficulty, and Alexander Hayes stepped in and got involved in that difficulty. I'll never forget that. So you, uh, the relationships are, are, are very deep on both sides of those armies. He's not a good student either, but he does graduate, unlike Armistead, 18th out of 25. And he's not, he's, you know, he's sent to, uh, to his first post, Fort Towson, uh, on the uh, in, in the Indian ter territory of what, now, what is now Oklahoma, and that is where in 1844 we have the first record of Armistead and Hancock being together. Uh, Armistead is the older man by seven years, so these guys did not go to West Point together. That's another myth that they met at West Point. Armistead is the older man by seven years, but they're at Fort Towson. They served together for 16 months on the frontier, and that's where the bond 
uh, creates. You know, they're on the, they're on the Oklahoma at that point is on the far edge of the country. They're on the edge of Texas, which is a republic. It's not even a, a state yet. So did they know each other? Of course they did. For the for the cynics who sit who pushed back, no, they weren't almost brothers, but they certainly knew each other. And you know, um, give us just a sense. They would have been serving out there with roughly how many other men? How how many? People would have been in that post. Well, the, it, w- it was only would have been maybe a hundred men, but in okay. their second post, they there were only six officers. So they lived, mm-hmm. you know, just this, this small group of people, um, and not much to do, frankly. So that's that's where those bonds were created. And then they both go off to fight in the Mexican War, and they fight side by side in the Mexican War. They're both brevetted for gallantry. Armistead actually was quite distinguished in the Mexican War. Uh, his fellow soldiers write about how brave he was. That's one thing you notice about his career. He may not have been the greatest commander, but he was a very brave soldier, always respected for that. And he is actually the first U.S. officer into the ditch in the final attack on Chapultepec. So um, these guys had combat action together as well. So that's this is where the friendship is, is formed. And they also served together in Mexico in the post-war occupation. Armistead commands a small company, and his lieutenants are Hancock, Another young man arrived from West Point named Henry Heath. And Heath, in his memoirs later, writes about this. He said, Armistead Hancock and I were messmates and never was a happier, never was a mess happier than ours. So these guys had deep roots, uh, you know, going back to the frontier of the Mexican War. Uh, well, give us a sense. So, so there's a, a time at which they are deciding to take opposite sides. Is there, what did your research show about kind of what led them to that decisions? And to what extent was there a conversation between the two of them about those decisions? The one thing about, about the almost brother myth to lead into this is in the 13 year period between the end of the Mexican war and the beginning of the civil war, 1848 to 1861, these guys are almost never together. There are no letters between, you know, they're, they weren't the almost brotherly kind of friends we think of. But they did communicate on occasion. They did see each other on occasion. And they are both stationed in Southern California uh, in late 1860, early 1861, as the war is is bubbling up. Uh, Hancock is in Los Angeles, where he is a quartermaster. And uh, Armistead is in San Diego, about 120 miles to the south, where he's running a small garrison there. Now, we we do know that uh, that Armistead... uh, made it up to, to through Los Angeles several times. You know, the one thing with researching these things, Lee, especially in the Civil War era, you can find, in addition to Army records, you can find a lot from the newspapers. They like to write about the Army, and they write often about Armistead being in, being in L.A. And, and so we, we know from Mrs. Hancock's book that just as they were about to de- depart, there, there's, this, you know, there's this party or gathering. Now, a, a lot of the soldiers, Mrs. Hancock writes that a lot of the Southern-based officers went to Hancock for advice. What should I do? Um, and he wasn't very helpful because he said, yeah, basically you have to make your own choice. I'm fighting for the Union. I'm a Union man. I'm not going to fight for states' rights. I want to be the, for the Union whole and undivided. So, yes, he was a Northerner, but he also was very pro-Union. Hancock was not an abolitionist. You know, the, the other myth, not all Union soldiers were abolitionists, but he wanted to keep the Union together. So uh, Armistead had gone to him and he didn't have much advice. And Armistead really, I think, struggled with his decision in large part because of his history with the U.S. Army and his family's history with the Star Spangled Banner. I mean, he was a native Southerner. He came from a long line of slaveholders. He briefly owned slaves himself. He, he believed in the Confederate cause and should be independence. But... His whole history of his family was was tied up with the army and the Star Spangled Banner, so he wrestled with it. Uh, he eventually does decide uh, to go with the Confederacy, as we know. And there's an interesting letter that I found in his son's military records, where it gives us the reason why Armistead made that choice. He wrote a letter in uh, December of '61, later trying to get his son on path to become a Confederate officer, and he wrote. I've been a soldier all my life. I was an officer in the army of the U S which service I left to fight for my own country and for and with my own people. And because they were right and oppressed for my own country and for and with my own people, that's the way he viewed things. 
So now Mrs. Hancock writes about this get together at the Hancock home in Los Angeles. Um, and, you know, lots of questions about this. Did it, did, did it, did she get the date right? Guess this or did it happen at all? We, you can't ever prove for certain. But the one thing I try to say was, okay, who did she, she say was there? And was it possible that they were all in Los Angeles at the same time? She only identified three people by person, by, by, in, by name. Armstead Hancock, obviously, and a future Confederate officer named Albert Sidney Johnston. Were they all there in L.A. at the same time, late spring, early summer of 61? Absolutely they were. Hancock and Albert Sidney Johnston lived there. And we know from newspaper records and letters that Armistead was in L.A. at least three times. So the circumstances existed for this meeting to take place. And then Mrs. Hancock writes about it, about how broken hearted Armistead was. And he was crying and Hancock, I, I can't believe I'm going to leave you. Um, you don't know what this has cost me. And he gave Mrs. Hancock a, uh, a satchel with some of his papers and a, and a fly book that he that he signed to her. Uh, in case he was uh, wounded in battle or killed in battle, she was supposed to pass it on to his family. And if that was the only account, there still would be a lot of questions. But I found another obscure account in an obscure book about Hancock that was written in 1880 when he was running for president, where the reporter doesn't quote him directly, but he attributes the information to Hancock. And he talks about getting together with Armistead before they left. And then Armistead even offered him his U.S. Army Major's uniform. So we have two sources that say they got together. So I believe, in fact, that, that they did. They had those conversations. And then, you know, as happened to a lot of people in the war, but because this was focused on the movie, they went off to fight against each other. A really, when we think of it today, a really surreal situation when you think about it. These guys who'd been, who'd known each other since 1844 and now here in 1861, they're going to fight for different armies and possibly meet on the same battlefield. Well, indeed, indeed. Uh, should we talk a little bit about what that journey west was like for those men, uh, especially those men joining the Confederacy? Yeah, I mean, it, it wasn't easy. Not only was it extremely hot, they're coming through Arizona and New Mexico and Texas. Uh, and there were not a, uh, hostile Native Americans, naturally. Um, you know, there was a lot, of, a lot of those kinds of things going on. And then there were Union garrisons and Union soldiers. Uh, these guys, are, so they really had to stay on their toes just to make it east. Uh, we have a fair amount of what happened to them as they got to Texas, as they're debating what to do. Uh, and then not so much in the last half of the trip, but it, Armistead left in left California in late June and he gets to Richmond in mid September. So think of that. That's how long it took them marching, riding stagecoach. Uh, so it was, it was, it was a, a brutal trip to get there. So these guys are very determined to get there though. It wasn't an easy trip. Uh, I could have seen somebody saying, why are we doing this? Why are, why are we going this far? And certainly some people did drop out, but some very key people made that coming, uh, 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 east from California. Hancock comes by boat. They come down, come cry, they hit land across the Isthmus of Panama and then get another boat and come up the East coast. And he is actually on a boat with union and Confederate officers. These guys are going and they're, they're traveling together to go fight each other in a war. And Hancock's wife writes about, they stopped in New Jersey. They, they, the destination was New York. They stopped in New Jersey to drop the Confederate officers off and, and then stopped in New York to drop the, I mean, we laugh at it. No, it's just surreal when you think of it. Yeah. See, you know, see ya. Uh, you know, the, the, there, there's that line in the, in the movie, see in hell. I mean, I think some of those things were probably said. I had no idea, you know, before I researched book that this kind of thing happens and we speak about it we, we can speak about it a little flippantly but it is amazing when you think of what happened in the country and what these guys on both sides went through indeed indeed um should we talk about the uh the experience that each of the two men had in the civil war then leading up to to meeting on the battlefield yeah it it was kind of fascinating to me with uh with hancock hancock does not have a lot of great days before gettysburg He's a fine officer. He's well respected, but much of his reputation is based on what happened in those three days at Gettysburg. And if you, if you're a quarterback, you're going to have your big day at the Super Bowl. That's what you want. That's what happened to Winfield Scott Hancock. Uh, he had a uh, he had a really good day at Williamsburg. 
where he got the name Hancock this this superb, where McClellan writes, uh, you know, to his it was a letter to his wife. It's all been written in the report. It's not in the official report. He writes to his wife, Hancock was superb today, and that word gets out. Uh, but Williamsburg was was a was a tough battle, but not one of the major battles of you know of the Civil War. And he's, you know, he's at he's at Fredericksburg, where they were no fault of his, they get slaughtered. He's in a rear guard action at Chancellorsville. So Gettysburg is really, you know, his his big stage. But he's very well thought of, and he's probably on a path to have command of an army as he as he's leaving Gettysburg. Now Armistead, you know, he becomes a uh, he starts by leading a, he gets to Richmond. He's going to lead a regiment to 57th Virginia. He never leads them in battle. He becomes a brigadier in April of 1862. His men are only in two pitched battles before Gettysburg. And they don't do very well in either of them. They're at Seven Pines and they're at Malvern Hill. Again, these were it wasn't all Armistead's fault as a commander, but the reality is he didn't have any victories. But the one thing I noticed again, even though his brigade was criticized, uh, the other officers again write about how brave Armistead was. The gallant Armistead. They all they all talk about this. Some of these guys knew him from the Mexican War, so he was a guy who led from the front uh, and who was there with his men. But again, not much to distinguish his performance until he gets to Gettysburg. So there, are, you know, there's Armistead has a spotty record, and Hancock has a good record, but it's there's not a lot of there's not a lot of depth there or great achievements. So. Uh, Gettysburg is really where, you know, we, there's a reason why we know of, of them at Gettysburg. And, and did, did each know of the other being at Gettysburg? They, no, they, well, talking, there's no evidence they were, I think the point for the movie, the novel, they weren't talking about facing each other. Army intelligence at that point, they, they were at some of the same battles. They were both in the seven days, but didn't fight against them. They were both in Antietam. They're actually pretty close in Antietam, but didn't fight against each other. It wasn't until Gettysburg that they that, that they fought against one, one another. But we, we get that question a lot, and I talk to some guides and rangers and historians, and there's no evidence. The, the probability is that they would have known that, the, that they were facing each other. In the third day of a battle at the same place, Army intelligence would have been pretty good. Prisoners, battle flags, Certainly the Confederates knew they were going up against the second corps, Hancock's corps on the second day at Gettysburg. And that's where it was. And the, the, the union men may have known because of prisoners that Pickett's division was here. But the, the, the key point I keep reminding me, they, it wasn't, a, Oh, Winnie boy. Oh, low. I wonder what, it, what, what he's doing over there. And as I, as, as I say in my book talks, um, I'm not even sure that low was Armistead's nickname. There is very, very scant evidence to that. Uh, it wasn't key to the story, so I wrote about it in the appendix of my book. I call it uh, "Lo and Behold." You can read it and figure it out if you want to know. But uh, there, there wasn't much evidence that. But if you Google "Low Armistead" today, you'll find about five million occurrences. Every, everybody since said just first him as well. You know, I think I think we should mention, and and we will have a uh, a, a link to your book. Um, but just heavily researched, heavily sourced, uh, really rich with detail. Um, so. Uh, take us through the take us through the conflict. Well, that, that yeah, the third day. Uh, you know, we know uh, Armistead was in the second line of Pickett's charge. He was he was uh, they there was a depth of the attack, and he wasn't happy with that at all. He wanted to be up front. He he sent he went to complain and no, this is the way we're doing it. So he leads his men across those fields. Every time I'm at Gettysburg and I walk across the field, I walk the field of Pickett's Charge all the time, basically because I can't believe these guys did this. I know the mindset was different. I still can't believe they did it. Um, but what what happened, the, the, the key point here is Armistead leads about 100 men over the wall. And that's, you know, that's where he, that's where his fame come from, his, comes from. His bald head is open to the sun. His hat's on his on his sword, you know, went across the wall. And there is, as students of the war will know, anybody who's been to Gettysburg, there's a small marker to, to Armistead about 100 feet into the angle. Lewis Armistead fell here marker. And there's a big debate still to this day, which we can never, you know, I present all sides of this, uh, kind of decided, you know, as to, is it accurately placed? And, and I'll say that, I, I talked to some groups, and I'll say, is it accurately placed? And everybody in the audience will shake their head, no, it is. We don't know. 
we, we don't know. There, whatever your theory is, you can find an eyewitness account to support it. There, there are accounts that say Armistead was hit as soon as he crossed the wall and fell there. Uh, there's one detailed account from a man in his brigade said he was hit as soon as he crossed the wall, but staggered forward to the second line of guns where he was hit again and where he fell, where that were markers. There are multiple accounts that he charged all the way past the wall up to the second line of guns, and that's where that's where he was hit. Uh, I tend to believe that when there are more accounts that say that from both sides, and, and most credibly from the Union commander at the wall, Alexander Webb, who writes a letter to his wife on July 6th, just three days after the battle, long before anybody was spinning what happened here. And he said, General Armistead, an old army officer, passed me with four of his men. So I think that indicates Webb wasn't going to give Armistead credit for anything he didn't do. So if he said he was bad, he, he writes about how he thought at that moment, he thought his career was over and the Union Army was done. Here were Confederate soldiers in the angle. You know, again, we have to remember these, you know, we know now that that's preposterous for him to have thought that, but all these guys saw was what a, a, a ten yard radius, maybe. They only knew what was happening right in front of them. So that you know that uh, it's probably as accurately placed as we could imagine. Um, and he got somewhere into the angle, and and that's the point. If it's ten feet off, you know who cares? We can people still love to argue about that stuff. But then, Lee, if you want me to get into, then there are, there's all about the the the. Uh, Armistead being assisted by Union officers and the Masonic legends that come through. And I was interested in looking at those because Lewis Armistead was a very proud member of the Masons. And a fair number of soldiers on both sides were in the Masons. One of them is that when Armistead went down wounded, that he uh, gave a coded Masonic phrase uh, for distress. I am the son of a widow. I'm a widow's son. And the story is that Union, Union soldiers who were Masons heard this and rushed forward to help him and carry him off the battlefield. There are enough accounts that that probably happened, but that isn't the only reason he would have been carried off. There's no way that Union soldiers are leaving a wounded Confederate general just to lay there, even if just for intelligence purposes, much less than respect. And they treated opposing generals with respect to this situation. So he's going to be carried off whether he's a Mason or not. The other one is that Arm, and this is the scene in the movie, although it's the wrong guy. Armistead is is a, is a Union officer comes up to him, and it's it's uh, Captain Henry Bingham, who by quirk of fate is a captain on a Hancock staff. Now in the movie, this is Joshua Chamberlain's brother, because at that point they can't they they can't introduce another character. But this is the story that we get. And Armistead is a Mason, Hancock's a Mason. Henry Bingham is a Mason. As a result, Carrie, we have uh, the very beautiful friend to friend Masonic memorial at the entrance to the Gettysburg Cemetery Annex. It's it's one of the most beautiful memorials uh, at the battlefield. It was put up in 1993. The, actually, by quirk of fate, the same year the movie came out. Um, and it's uh, you know it's it, it's a spectacular. Uh, monument and, and the idea is the country coming together but the story here is that is, is that Bingham helped Armistead because they were Masons I looked into that as deeply as you could it may be true there's no evidence at all that it's true the only, I, I think the Masons have done a really good job of PR and marketing which having worked in PR and marketing I I respect that and it, it it's legit they, they all were Masons. And, and by the way, when, when the Masons uh, proposed this uh, to the Gettysburg National Military Park, their first idea was a, a, a statue of Armistead and Hancock shaking hands. And the park turned that down because that didn't happen. This scene did happen. Henry Bingham did assist Lewis Armistead. Was it because they were Masons? The only people who know are Armistead and Bingham. And Armistead died two days later. Uh, Bingham only wrote about this twice in his life both in private letters to his fellow Mason Hancock, never mentioned. So there's no direct mention because of a Mason. There's no secondary evidence. This is all inferred. Uh, the other thing that makes me question it is, if you read Bingham's full account, he's writing up, he knows a Confederate officer is down. He thinks it's James Longstreet. 
He heard that James Longstreet was wounded. Longstreet is not a Mason. He's going to help him anyway. So I, I'm not, you know, I, I'm not sure that was the motivation, but they all were Masons and it led to this very beautiful monument. And it led to uh, Armistead being carried to uh, the 11th Corps Field Hospital at the George Fangler Farm uh, to be treated, uh, and, you know, with respect as a, as a fallen officer. Uh, so, Tom, in, in, in your research, you've obviously uh, taken a, a close look at, at so many aspects here. Uh, are there one or two others that deserve special mention uh, that will help either confirm or uh, correct what, what people believe? Yeah, it, there, there's, you know, there's, they ask, people ask about Hancock writing about Armistead. Hancock didn't write about Armistead after the battle, other than these two letters to Bingham, where he asked about the circumstances of Armistead's wounding. But that doesn't raise an antenna to me about their friendship because, you know, Arm, all we know about Arm, what we know about Armistead ended at the Battle of Gettysburg. Hancock went in to live for, live for 20 more years, and, and he had quite a life after the battle. I mean, he was, he was wounded there, took about six months to recover, served through the rest of the Civil War. He oversaw the, the execution of the Lincoln conspirators. He fought Indians in Kansas. He was briefly and controversially the military governor of Louisiana, where he had got into a huge feud with Ulysses S. Grant. You know, Ulysses S. Grant pushing Reconstruction, Hancock, no abolitionist. They clashed. Uh, and then he runs for pre He ran for president three times. He was the nominee in 1880, but he was in the process twice before that. And he uh, he almost became the vice presidential nominee in 1876. He was actually considered in 1868 when he would have run against U.S. Grant. So I think that's one of the reasons you don't see a lot about Armistead in 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 the Hancock books is there was so much else in the rest of his life that it, it, it wasn't that big of a factor. Um, but, uh, you know, I'm convinced that, you know, that that they were friends. The other interesting uh, aspect is that Armistead, the doctors don't think, the Union doctors don't think that his wounds are mortal. They fully expect him to live. He was wounded in the arm and the leg. He dies two days later on July 5th. Um, you know, they don't know much about germs. They might have been a wound they didn't see. But most of the modern doctors I talked to say it was a pulmonary embolism. I only know that because I talked to doctors, but there's a blood clot that would have formed in his leg and gone into his lung, and that would have caused that almost instantaneous death. Um, very interesting, and he's buried in a shallow grave on the Spangler farm, and his story might have ended there, except that a cold-hearted Gettysburg doctor wanted to dig him up and embalm him because he thought Armistead's relatives would pay for the body, and he was correct. And I run some correspondence between the doctor's representative and Lewis's first cousin down in Baltimore, Christopher Armistead, the son of the hero Fort McHenry, who pays $100 for the body. And Lewis's body is sent to Baltimore and buried in the same family vault in Baltimore as George Armistead. They are side by side. Their nameplates are side by side. This is pretty much a private cemetery now. It's gated and locked and only open for occasional tours. Uh, but there they are. For a long time, people didn't know where Armistead was buried. Um, but that that that's where it is. So there's you find all these. That was a story I didn't expect to find. You find all these little, you know, little little tidbits um, that that add add so much depth to the story. So I, I think, you know, my conclusion was a lot of the movie and the novel are wrong. Uh, they weren't almost brothers. They weren't even best friends in the modern sense because they spent so much time away from each other. But they had that bond as soldiers. They served on the frontier. They fought together. And that bond lasted 19 years until they met at Gettysburg. When, you know, this becomes, were there friends who fought against each other? Sure. But here we are at the most famous attack of the most famous battle. We had Armistead's men attacking Hancock's men and both fall wounded. That's what makes the story compelling and would have made it compelling anyway, were it not a novel and a movie. Somebody would have would have would have dug it up. But I, I was struck by my book got reviewed by the Civil War Times and it was by an impressive Civil War scholar who I don't know, uh, Ethan Refuse. And he said, I can't believe it took this long for somebody to, to do a book like the review of Armistead and Hancock. So I took that as a, as a sideways compliment. Well, well in, indeed, indeed. Quite a compliment. Um, I, I, I think this would be a good opportunity to uh, let other folks ask questions.
questions. Carrie, do you want to join us and and, uh, and and bring forth the questions that we've gotten? Indeed. All right. We have someone who would like to know, how did Armistead, who was a failed West Point cadet, get to be an officer in the U.S. Army? Aha. Uh -huh. It's good to have a father who's a brigadier general and an uncle who's a U.S. congressman. So there is, he, he did leave West Point in 1836, and there's about a three-year gap in the story of his life. I couldn't find much of what happened in those intervening years. But 1839, there is a war going on with the Seminole Indians down in Florida, the Second Seminole War. And the U.S. Army needed officers. There were a lot of people who wanted to go down there at this point. And you know, he still had the Armistead family name. He had gone to West Point. And, and he has great connections with his father and his uncle. So he gets this appointment. The thing that really struck me, really must have ticked off some of his classmates. His last class at West Point graduated July 1st, 1839. Their commissions date to that day. Lewis's commission dated July 10th. All those shenanigans, not even on campus the last three years. He only loses nine days in rank. So he, he gets, and he's in hot combat. But about the second or third day he's there, he's in a he's in a fight with the Seminole Indians. But a few months into his tenure, U.S. Army decides to make a change in the command structure, and they were changing the command in Florida all the time. The new commander of all U.S. troops in the Florida theater is General Brigadier General Walker Keith Armistead. So Lewis, uh, his his experience there changes dramatically. He becomes a staff officer for his for his father. So he's out of combat, but he does get to see how a, you know, how a, a general runs an army. So that was probably a valuable service, but that's how he gets back in. The, the name helped him every step of the way and his father helped him. And believe me, he used the name at times. Lewis is on, he gets a lot of leave. He, he was a hard nosed soldier, but he also gets a lot of leave. I, I think you really played on the family name. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, we have a viewer who would like to know if you have any other books in the works on other Gettysburg figures. Not any Gettysburg figures yet. I think my next book, and you always have to have a project and somebody has to want to publish it, but I think I'm going to divert. Now, even though the Civil War is my passion and I'm about to, my wife and I are about to become uh, ambassadors down in Antietam where they need a little more help than in Gettysburg. We love that, that, that battlefield too. But I'm fascinated by the story of Louis Armistead's uncle, George Armistead, and the original Star Spangled Banner, which is at the Smithsonian today. But the only reason it's there is because he broke army rules and took it off. By the way, it was his idea to have a big flag. He wanted so the British would see it. He took it off the pole, took it home, and it remained in the private possession of his family, four generations of his family, for 90 years. Until a grandson got tired of preservation and gave here, you know, here to the, to the Smithsonian. It's a fascinating story, Odyssey of American history. So I, I may get into that. And, and, you know, Lewis fought for the Confederacy. A bunch of the Armisteads were Confederate sympathizers. You know, the, the whole history of the country is wrapped up in this. So it's what maybe, but I think I would love to write another civil war book. I'd love to write in a Gettysburg book, but these things are hard work. They take a lot of time. And we do this as a passion. So you really need a passion for the topic. I have people suggesting topics to me. It's almost, you can't, something, it has to be in here or in here. You have to really want to do it because it takes a lot of time. And you, if it's a labor of love, which these books, you don't mind it. You're working on them all the time. And thankfully my wife is a history nerd too. So she loves it and helps me research, but I would have trouble just being assigned. So if something pops into my head, like the Gettysburg Rebels did, or this one, then I'm, then I'm off on it. But I think I, I've already done so much of the research on George Armistead and the family that I may try to do that. Well, well let, me, let me just add very quickly. That sounds fascinating. If you do that, we'd love to have you back uh, for, for you to educate all of us. And, and if I could just ask, I, you know, talk to us in that book about how that huge flag gets made. I think I know a little bit of the story, but I think that would... Probably almost yeah. interesting, and then for it yeah. to be his idea and so forth. Anyway, it'll be a, it'll be a great book and great talk, Tom. And, and, and yeah, I think it's yeah. Well, and that that's that's part of it, and also why it's eight feet shorter than it used to be because the Armistead ladies would cut yeah. off snippings. Uh, but the fact that it still exists this this you know this long a witness to that battle, 
you know, against the framework, too, of all the contours that's gone on with the anthem in the last five years. But whatever you're on that side, but most people don't know the story of how it all started. Sure. It may or may not change your view, whatever your view is. But I know from reading some of the comments, most people have no idea of, of why the flag was there and why the song was written in the first place. And Key was not trying to write a national anthem. He was just writing a song. He, he was writing a song that he finished two days after the battle. He was writing a description of the battle, which 117 years later became the national anthem. So it's... it's so I should let us get back to the Civil War, but we yes. will look forward to that. Yes. <laughs> All right, we do have a couple more questions. Um, first, how and when did Hancock learn of Armistead's death? He learned, he was, at, Hancock was wounded at about the same time. The other really real quirk of fate here is these guys are wounded at about the same time, maybe 200 yards apart, which is really a surreal part of the story. Uh, Hancock was told, but when Bingham, Captain Henry Bingham, his staff officer who, by quirk of fate had attended to Armistead. When Bingham reported back to Hancock, he told him. So probably 15 or 20 minutes after uh, Armistead was carried away. In the movie, Bingham, the, the Bingham character tells Armistead that, uh, that, that Hancock is wounded. They did not, they did not know they were wounded at that time. It was after the fact. And 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 there's a little bit of evidence that Armistead, when he was at the Spangler Front, would have heard about Hancock's wounding too. So uh, it was it was certainly on the same day, but not at that moment. OK, great. OK, we have a viewer who would like to know, uh, did their experience together impact their individual strategies at the battle? For example, you know, you kind of get the idea in the movie that this general knows how that general operates. And does that impact them? I don't, I, I don't think, I think because we look at the movie and the novel and we focus, distill it down to these two guys, um, it, it wasn't that. It was a massive attack uh, with a massive defense. And Hancock was in charge of the entire defense. He wouldn't have been worried, even if he knew Armistead was coming, he wouldn't have been worried about Armistead. And Armistead also was only a brigade commander. It was in the second line. So it, it wasn't, you know, Hancock against Lee or Hancock against Pickett, even you're talking to brigade commander. So, so no, they, you know, they, they wouldn't have known that, 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 that wouldn't have been a factor. I, I think that certainly is, is, is a good point throughout the war. I think that did affect other battles and other generals. They didn't know each other. They all learned the same tactics. They went to the same military school. That was, that's one of the really, you know, fascinating aspects of this war. Uh, how many wars has that happened in? You know, when, when you step away and think of it, the American Civil War is, is, is really a, a unique occurrence uh, from that as, as we study the military aspects of it. Um, and, and, you know, Cadmus Wilcox on the Confederate General wrote an artillery guide that, that both armies followed. So it's, it, it's kind of absurd when you, when you think of it that way. But in this case, no. And, and I think we, we can be guilty of distilling it to these guys against each other. They, they weren't jockeying against each other. Right. Okay. Thank you. Well, this has been fantastic. And as you know, as I say every time, there is so much more in the book. So check out the book. We're going to put a link in the chat for you and make sure that you take a look at that. Uh, one thing we wanted to let you know about too is a series of prints that we uh, released last year. Let me see if I can get this right. I do this when I'm not talking. So hold on here. <laughs> Uh, we released a print in October um, that highlights Gettysburg. And let me just put that up on the screen here so you can see that. There we go. Um, this has original artwork that we commissioned to highlight and honor Gettysburg. So we will put a link to that in the chat as well if you're interested in looking at this. We have a fine art version that is uh, screen printed. Everything is made in the USA. The paper is made in the USA. The screen printing is done right here in Richmond, Virginia. And they are signed and numbered by the artist. And then we also have some other options for you as well. We have magnets and smaller prints and uh, stickers and that sort of thing. So we'll put a link to that in the chat um, if you would like to check that out as well. And, uh, just to uh, reiterate, 100% of those proceeds go directly to support programs like this. Absolutely. 
All right, if you enjoyed this tonight, there are a few things that you can do to support it. You can tell your friends about it, share our emails and social posts. If you're not on our email list, please sign up at historycamp.org. That way you'll get notices every week of what the program will be about. And of course, consider making a small donation to the Pursuit of History or perhaps purchasing one of these prints that will also uh, support the Pursuit of History. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. And next week, join us again when we will be speaking with Jean Abrams about John and Abigail Adams and their time in Europe. We will talk about how that shaped them and how that shaped their view of America and what they wanted America to be. So you will want to be in on that conversation as well. Thank you so much for your time tonight and for a great book, Tom. Thank, Thank you very you. much, Carrie Lee, everyone. I really enjoyed it. Thank you for having me.